So what do we know about Mary? Well, there's lots that we do pick up in Scripture, and there's lots that our church does tell us. Um, there's four dogmas that pertain to her, and uh, some of them are ones that are accepted uh, for, you know, throughout our whole Christian you know, faith, and there's some that are debated and questioned. Of course, this particular feast that we celebrate today, the Assumption of Mary, you know, is one that's kind of debated a little bit and questioned and, you know, wondered where does this come from. Um, you know, that, that happens a lot. That happens a lot, especially, you know, being Catholic, you know, we do take Mary and place her up, you know, a little bit higher. And uh, we don't worship her, but we adore her. We adore her. I I actually preached this uh, last year, the Assumption of Mary, and I remember telling all of you, if you remember, you know, one of the things I have always tried to teach my sons is that uh, when you are courting that uh, person, that young lady, get to know her mother, you know? Butter up to her mother as much as you can, and then you're in, you know? That's the way I always told them. I says, get to know her, respect her, love her, and you'll be surprised how that comes around and it brings you a gift. Well, I say the same thing with Mary sometimes, too, the mother of our Lord. Why do we adore her so much? Because she is the mother of our Lord. Why wouldn't we give her just a little bit more respect, a little bit more adoration? Well, because through her is Christ. Through her is Christ. You know, our church gives us these four dogmas, all right? The first, of course, has to do with, you know, the virgin birth that, you know, she conceived and brought our Lord into this world, the incarnation. That's not really disputed too much. Most of our Christian denominations all accept that. You know, the second took a little bit more discussion. So much discussion, it wasn't until the, towards the middle part of the, the third century, actually about 431 at the Council of Ephesus, that the church finally decided to define, you know, her role in the not just mother of Jesus, but the mother of God, often referred to in the Greek as the Theotokos, all right, the mother of God. The church defined that, not just the mother of Jesus, but the mother of God. You know, the third one came along in the, the mid-1800s under Pius IX, when Pope Pius IX, IX defined her immaculate conception, you know, if she brought the mother of, or, or the son of God into this world, you know, there had to be a purity about her, you know, that she was full of grace, just not half full of grace, but full of grace. She also experienced that immaculate conception so that our Lord came into this world, you know, in perfection. You know, the fourth is what we celebrate today. It wasn't until November 1st of 1950 that Pius XII he also defined this particular day, the Assumption of Mary, where we believe that body and soul, well, she was taken up into heaven. It took until 1950, but there were many traditions and many stories, you know, that were shared and practiced. I mean, it isn't that just in 1950 we all of a sudden started this. It was a part of our church and the church discussion for many, many years, well, there was no proof of finding you know, the remains of Mary. There had to be something. You know, with all this, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, I still have my moments where I wonder. You know, as a good Catholic, I follow those dogmas. But, you know, like a good Christian, I also follow the Second Corinthians where, you know what, I walk by faith, not by sight. So some things we just accept and believe because we have to believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to believe in this tradition. And our church is leading us, that God is revealing, you know, these things to us to help us, to help us. But even with all this said, I mean, to be honest with you, my reflection today didn't get drawn so much to what do I believe about Mary, all right? Because Mary does hold a special place. But I'm going to take a, go away from that just a little bit here because all I kept doing was reading this gospel today and thinking about that visit, thinking about that visit between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth and how important that visit has become to us as Christians and how it kind of speaks to us about maybe why we even just gather here today and what this is all about. 
Now, it is in that visit that, again, Elizabeth affirms that this person, Mary, is special. That she has accepted something special in her life that she said yes in a very powerful way and brought our Lord into this world. But let's think about that visit and how that visit, in some sense, reflects everything that we do here, that reflects why we come to church. All right? So we have two women, kinsfolk, as they call them, and they gather together. Mary goes to help her, to be with her cousin, her older cousin who is having a baby. It's not, you know, something that she did every day, and we don't even really know how well she might have known Elizabeth, but being the younger one, she was sent to help her out. All right, so you have this kind of chance meeting of people, of two individuals, but why do they come together? Why did those two ladies come together? Because of Christ. Now, let's look at that in respect to why we're here. I mean, we gather as people, not people that normally would get together. You know, I mean, I really don't hang out with Spike except for on Sunday mornings. That's it. It's basically as much as I can take of him. Okay? So, no, just joking, Spike. But it isn't that, you know, we gather together outside of this. We come together because of our love of Christ and Christ's love for us. I mean, in that chance meeting of Mary and Elizabeth, it was about Christ. So it's the same thing that's reflected here. I mean, you look around. I mean, honestly, I mean, some people you know, some people you know by name, some people you know by face, but you know one thing for sure, we all love Christ, and that's why we're coming here today. I mean, that gives us some, I think, strength in, in our day and in how we live each day to know that there's others walking the same journey, that even in the challenges of life, you know, we come to Christ. It's kind of encouraging. It's encouraging to see this. It's encouraging that you're here with each other. I mean, that's one of the things I always try to encourage, you know, with my kids or other people is that, you know, we need this gathering. You know, we come together for Christ, but we need this. I mean, yes, it's okay to be spiritual and believe, but I need this community. I need to be lifted up by the same love of Christ, you know, that you have that, that I have to be reminded of because I know in your stories... It lifts me up. So that's an important thing. Another characteristic of that meeting is the praise of God. The praise of God. You think about it, all right? Both Elizabeth and Mary. I mean, Elizabeth praises God for Mary coming in there, that the mother of our Lord, she says, comes and visits me. She praises God at that moment. And then what does Mary do? Mary does the same thing. She then, you know, you know, praises uh, God in her song, what we call the Magnificat. I mean, I love the words of it, you know. I mean, my soul proclaims. My soul proclaims the greatness of the God, of God. Our song, everything that we do, our prayer. Together, as a community, we're praising the greatness of God. And I hope in your prayer and in your song, maybe that's what you feel too. My soul praises the greatness. My soul praises his greatness. I mean, everything that we do here is giving praise and thanksgiving to him. It culminates with the Eucharist. I mean, what does that mean, but thanksgiving? I mean, it's in this gathering that we come together and we say, thank you, God. You are great, and I know it is you that can just lead me wherever I'm going, no matter what uh, happens in my life, no matter what happens in my life. It's God. I mean, this gathering here today you know, is reflective of that moment when Mary and Elizabeth got together. I think it's a beautiful thing to kind of, you know, grab onto. And, and the final thing that I think is interesting, too, and I don't know if you catch, caught this in the Magnificat, but, you know, Mary, as she is praising God and she's praising what God is all about, she also kind of challenges us because she says these words where she says, God scattered the proud in their conceit. He cast down the mighty from their thrones. 
He lifted up the lowly. He fills the hungry with good things. He sends the rich away empty. I mean, in that line right there that she is praising God with, you know, she's saying, look it, I mean, sometimes we have to shake up the social order. Sometimes we have to shake up the way we do things. Sometimes we have to refocus ourselves and say, are we doing what Christ calls us to do? Are we living the Jesus way? Are we doing what Jesus wants us to do? This gathering is about that. It's about bringing us to kind of that focus in life that we say, I got to do things differently. I got to treat people differently. I got to speak a little bit differently. I got to act just a little bit differently. I mean, that gathering of Mary and Elizabeth in that moment, you know, again, sends us a message. We're not to walk away from this liturgy or any liturgy that we gather together as we don't walk away without being changed, without being transformed, without saying to ourselves, when I go out that door, I'm going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be a little bit more like Christ. I know today we're really supposed to focus on, you know, Mary and, and just what all this is about, the assumption, but you think about it, I mean, Mary's whole life was pointed up. Mary's whole life was pointed towards her son. One of the things I always like to say when, whenever I get into discussions with other Christians about, you know, how we Catholics adore her, you know, I say, Mary never really said, hey, come to me and follow me. Mary said, oh, uh, I want to be up on the throne, worship me. Mary never said, pray to me. She never said that. I always love well, the only times that she spoke in Scripture, okay, in the second chapter of John, with Jesus' first miracle, when he changed the water into wine. I mean, what did she say? She said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. You know, today we praise her, yes. We praise God, though, for her. And we look to her as that great example, that great example of faith, that it was a strong yes, that it was a belief. When you think about her life, you know, she had struggles, I'm sure, but she knew who Jesus was. She knew what Jesus' life was about. And at that end, God took her up and said, you're going to lead the way for others. Just like you said yes to Jesus, I want other people to look to you and say yes to Jesus, but also one day, I'm going to take everyone up in body and soul, just like I did you. Today, we should be transformed. We should look to Mary and say, help us to listen to your son just a little bit more. Help us to do what he tells us, just a little bit more.